How do you trust the chain of narration for the Hadiths? How do you define Sahih and Lesser? And we'd love to hear it from you as a, as a great Shakespeare. Me, I think the whole Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. It has reached us that Mr. Dry Wood has been made the Grand Mufti of Speaker's Corner by the Christian Association of Speaker's Corner. Here we see him dishing out fatwas and answering questions like a mullah from the heart of Khorasan in Afghanistan. Firstly, before diving deep into the questions and answer section with Mufti Dry Wood, let's like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and lastly, support the channel if you can. Link will be in the description. Secondly, it is important we quickly address the bold claim of Avery. <laughs> Muhammad didn't know what the Injil was, or what was in it, and neither does Siraj, because he hasn't answered the question. What is the Injil? If ignorance was a human being that will be God logic, no wonder people call him no logic. Not only is it ridiculous to say the prophet upon him be peace doesn't know the Injil or what is in it, it is also scandalous. If Ivory would have done himself a favor by reading the Quran, he would have come upon the saying of Allah in Quran 5 verse 48. Allah says, And we have revealed to you, O Muhammad, the book that is the Quran in truth, confirming that which preceded it of the scripture, and as a criterion over it. How can the Quran be a criterion over the Torah and the Injil if the one upon whom the Quran was revealed doesn't know what's in them? Again, if this is not ignorance on the part of ivory, then it must be something worse. Allah continued, So judge between them by what Allah has revealed, and do not follow their inclinations away from what has come to you of the truth. As for what the Injil is, we will be generous enough to reiterate to Ivory and to those of you Christians who missed it in our last video. As Muslims, we believe the Injil is a revelation given to Jesus upon him be peace, for the guidance and salvation of the children of Israel, Allah says. And we sent, following in their footsteps, Jesus, the son of Mary, confirming that which came before him in the Torah, and we gave him the gospel, in which was guidance and light, and confirming that which preceded it of the Torah as guidance and instruction for the righteous. Now let's get back to the crux of today's video, Mufti Dry Wood was asked. To the Hadiths, how do you define Sahih and Lesser? And we'd love to hear it from you as a, as a great shape. Me, me, I think the whole the methodology is garbage. Hey, hey, well, China, you've got telephone, is it telephone? You call it, it? It's pretty bad because the, method, the methodology wasn't wasn't invented until later. I just handed that one. And if you, if you look at actual uh, non-Muslim, non-Muslim Hadith scholars, right? There, there's always been lots of um, non-Muslim Quran scholars. Non-Muslim Hadith scholars are comparatively uh, rarer. And I mean, they treat, they treat the Hadith basically like it's a joke. Mm -hmm. uh, because the, 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 the actual position of the scholars is that, is that Islam early on was like regional. Like you had a, you had a, Kufa had its own version and Mecca had its own version and so on. If eloquence was intelligence, Drywood would have won an Oscar. I mean, who would have known how ignorant Drywood was if the Christians at Speaker's Corner did not make him their grand mufti from whom they can take knowledge? Secondly, when Drywood said the actual position of scholars. Do not be deceived into thinking he is referring to Muslim scholars. The scholars he has in mind is the likes of Christian princess. That's the man he unfortunately takes knowledge from. No Muslim scholar will say Islam early on was regional, and the people of Kufa have their own version, and the people of Mecca have their own version as if to say, the people of Kufa believe in two Allah, and the people of Mecca believe in one, as is the case in Christianity today. Islam has always been one version, and believe, which is the worship of Allah, and the believe that Muhammad upon him be peace, is the messenger of Allah. Although Muslims may differ in the approach or understanding of some certain matters of the deen, but you will never find them wanting in their core doctrines. And once they start trying to come up with like a one Islam, like a pan-Islamic system, they have to go sort of place by place, and everyone's just cooking up isnads like it's a sport to give authority to their own positions. And so they're 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 writing their isnads into their into their hadiths and so on. And the the better you did it, the the more the you know the more reliable person you traced it back to, the reliable your hadith was. So it's like it was a sport. It was a sport basically. And so yeah, the whole system's a giant joke. The only joke here is you, Mr. Dry Wood. And to be honest, only few people like Dry Wood have mastered the act of looking confident while dishing out lies like it's a piece of cake. It's obvious Drywood doesn't know what his nad is and the science behind it. He wrongly thinks any 
anyone can just make up an isnad and get away with it just as the writers of the Bible fabricate visions of Jesus to give credit and validation to their claims. If the science of isnad was to be applied to the Bible today, the Bible will be a complete joke. Isnad Brothers and Sisters is a comprehensive list of authorities who have transmitted a report of a statement, action, or approbation going back to the Prophet upon him be peace. It is a unique feature Allah has blessed this ummah with. No other nation, religion, or community can claim or boast to have such rigorous analysis of the various aspects of their faith. Early Muslim scholars examined and analyzed each and every statement that came to them, whether it was the statement of the Messenger of Allah upon him be peace, his companions, or anyone else. They studied the life and character of those who were part of the transmitting chain called Isnad in the strictest way possible. Thus, the Ummah witnessed an amazing introduction of the science of studying the reporters of Hadith, Rijal al-Hadith, which was unprecedented and is unrivaled till today. The recording of the names, dates of birth, dates of demise, qualities and characteristics of thousands and thousands of people is something that only Muslims possess. So it is ludicrous for dry wood to claim people fabricated Isnad like it's a sport, and the more reliable person you trace it back to the more reliable your hadith. As a well-wisher, I will advise him to educate himself, starting with the book called Mustalahul Hadith, The Science of Hadith. There, he will learn how impossible it is for people to manipulate Isnad. An example will be this Hadith of Abu Huraira, where he reported a saying of the Prophet. This Hadith was transmitted by at least 13 of his students whom are well known to us. Also, there are 16 scholars who transmitted this Hadith from these students of Abu Huraira, and all of these people are well known to us. So how is it possible for someone to manipulate Isnad without being caught? And the, so the position among non-Muslim Hadith scholars is you need to treat these with extreme skepticism and the presumption should be that Hadith is false or, or, or so massively distorted that it's unrecognizable yeah. and that you have to work very, very hard using certain methods to get to anything that's reliable. Again, your opinion on what's sound or not holds no weight to us. You treat hadith with skepticism or you presume that hadith is false or massively distorted is nothing strange to us. What's important is we already have a working frame that helps us know sound hadith from the weak and fabricated hadith you all love quoting. Well, the question, so in the Quran, because it's perfectly preserved, does it mention that the hadiths would come? So we should... There are passages they interpret that way. But yes, there are parts we interpret that way because that's what it clearly insinuates. For example, Quran 16 verse 64 clearly says, And we have not revealed to you the book, except for you to make clear to them that wherein they have differed, and as guidance and mercy for a people who believe. It is now obvious that one of the main reasons the Quran was revealed was for the Prophet to make clear to us in areas we differed. The companions were lucky enough the Prophet was with them to make clear to them these things, but we are not as lucky as they were, which now makes it binding on us to act upon that which rectified the affairs of the companions who were with the Prophet. And what is that? If not the ahadith of the Prophet upon him be peace. But, I mean, the, the Quran over and over again claims to be perfectly clear, explained in detail, all these things, Unchanged. and yet you can't understand any of it without going to these later sources from two centuries later. To say we do not understand any of it is another lie to drag Islam under the bus. As a matter of fact, we do understand much of it. We may, however, differ on the understanding of some of it, which will require us to go back to the ahadith of the Prophet, for example, the prayers. The Quran gives no detailed explanation on how each and every prayers should be performed and what should be said in them. So we have to go back to how the Prophet was inspired to make clear to us this, things referencing you back to Quran 16 verse 64. Secondly, Hadith wasn't invented two centuries later, rather that was when it was compiled. Before that, people were aware of these traditions orally, and some Hadith were written down even during the lifetime of the Prophet. A notable example is the Hadith of Abu Shah, where the Prophet towards the end of his life commanded a Hadith be written down for Abu Shah. To figure out what it means, and so uh, it's kind of a big, massive joke, I'd say. Amen. So what are your What are your thoughts on all this, man? Uh, I just followed the original Quran, man, before it got corrupted. The original what? The original Quran. The original the Quran. uncorrupted Quran. The, the, Quran, the Quran today has been tampered no, 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 with. No, no, before Uthman. No, Uthman's the one who corrupted it. Uthman corrupted it. Burn the Quran. Burn the Quran. Burn it. Yeah. Burn them all. So this lame argument, often regurgitated by Jahil Ivory, is laughable. Uthman never corrupted the Quran. Rather, Allah used him to protect the Quran from becoming what has become of the Bible and the Torah.
To understand this properly, allow me to take you through a history class. After the death of Prophet Muhammad upon him be peace, it was realized that many of those who had died in military campaigns had been memorizers of the Quran, with around 70 dying in the Battle of Yamama alone. Umar ibn al-Khattab suggested to Caliph Abu Bakr that the entire Quran be compiled and written down. Abu Bakr entrusted this task to Zayd ibn Thabit, who had worked as a scribe for Prophet Muhammad. Zayd ibn Thabit was a leading scholar and memorizer of the Quran. After carrying out this task meticulously, Zayd ibn Thabit prepared the official compilation of the Quran. The pages which were compiled compiled during the time of Caliph Abu Bakr were known as a mushaf. This word literally means a manuscript that is bound between two covers as a single volume. After Abu Bakr, this mushaf was transferred to Caliph Umar and stayed with him during his lifetime. Later, it was transferred to his daughter Hafsa. This will lead us to a hadith which dry wood and ivory avoid like it's a plague. Narrated by Anas bin Malik. Hudayfa bin al-Yaman came to Uthman at the time when the people of Syria and the people of Iraq were waging war to conquer Armenia and Azerbaijan. Hudayfa was afraid of their differences in the recitation of the Quran, so he said to Uthman, O chief of the believers, save this nation before they differ about the book as the Jews and Christians did before. So Uthman sent a message to Hafsa, saying, Send us the manuscripts of the Quran, so that we may compile the Quranic materials in perfect copy and return the manuscripts to you. This is the same Quran compiled by Abu Bakr, the first Khalif. Hafsa sent it to Uthman. Uthman then ordered Zaid bin Thabit, Abdullah bin Az-Zubair, Sa'id bin Al-As, and Abdurrahman bin Harith bin Hisham to rewrite the manuscripts in perfect copies. Uthman said to the three Qurayshi men, In case you disagree with Zaid bin Thabit on any point in the Quran, then write it in the dialect of Quraysh. The Quran was revealed in their tongue. They did so, and when they had written many copies, Uthman returned the original manuscripts to Hafsa. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, be burnt. Remember the original copy with Hafsa, the wife of the Prophet, was not burnt, but returned to her. The decision of Uthman burning the Quran was applauded by the companions of the Prophet upon him be peace, as we would see in the narration of Zaid. Zaid is reported to have said, I saw the companions of Muhammad going about saying, By Allah, Uthman has done well. By Allah, Uthman has done well. There are many more things to say and evidences to provide, but I believe this is more than enough for those seeking truth. Truth. I remain Abdul Aid Mubarak and catch you in the next one.